wonderful and exciting to speak to you today about bridging the gap between research or evidence and practice in children and young people's mental health. Three members of our team are going to present today, including myself. Um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Oxford. I've got Tim Clark, um, who is principal clinical psychologist, is going to present too, and then Sarah Cheno, who is um, our implementation consultant on this project as well. So I'll pass over to them uh, shortly. So in terms of what we'd like to get out of this workshop, we'll first think a little bit about implementation models. What are they? How we can use them? How do we choose the right one? Then we'll think about bridging the gap, the research practice gap, and what we know so far. And then finally, we'll talk a bit about the practical tips and next steps. And we're really keen to learn from you as well and hear your thoughts about how we can take this work forward. And I think we have such an opportunity in the room today from a group of mixed professionals to really hear your thoughts about uh, next steps and what's working well in your context, what's challenging. Um, so we're really keen to take full advantage of the, the room that we've got here today. Um, so I guess before we go any further, what do we mean by implementation? Well, I just wanted to define um, what we mean by implementation evidence here. And I know these concepts can mean different things to different people. But by implementation, we mean the systematic uptake, integration and embedding of research and evidence based practices into routine practice to improve the quality and effectiveness of mental health services and care for children and young people. And again, with evidence based practice and evidence, clearly there are different defini definitions and that means something different to different people. And there are different types of evidence that are useful in different contexts. Um, but we're really thinking about practices that improve outcomes for young people here. And um, I guess just a bit of background to this about why this matters. So we know that despite efforts to increase access to services and proliferation of the number of interventions available over several years, outcomes for children and young people could still be improved. And I think to some extent this can be attributed to this kind of complex and lengthy process of implementing research into practice. And we know that providers of services, so clinicians and practitioners, are faced with a really complex array of challenges um, and barriers which can impede the implementation and adoption of established evidence-based practice. But at the same time, researchers face their own set of challenges in progressing their findings into real work practice. And one thing I kind of first noticed when I started doing implementation research was that often implementation outcomes, so things like feasibility and acceptability and adoption from trials are often not reported or recorded. So we actually don't have a good idea about why things work and they don't. So I think using implementation models and frameworks to guide our research questions and uh, writing up our papers can really help kind of bridge that gap. So I think just when we're thinking about um, implementation science and implementation research as a field, it sits right at the end of the spectrum of research where we're taking what we know works and embedding it and putting a plan into action to improve health outcomes. So it's less about the clinical effectiveness and more about the embedding of evidence into practice. And when thinking about implementation, whether that's evaluating how well implementation is working or thinking about implementing, implementing something new, there are several different models and frameworks to choose from, which can be quite overwhelming when you're trying to implement something and knowing what to pick. There's so many, um, so it being quite helpful to break them down by categories. And when I first started to do implementation research, I found this diagram extremely useful and I often recommend it to others. So it's by Nielsen and colleagues. And here in the green boxes, um, you can see the different categories of implementation models that you have to choose from. So the aim of process models, for example, is to describe or guide the process of translating uh, research into practice. And these models outline the phases or stages that you need to go through um, if you're trying to implement something for the first time. Whereas if you're trying to understand the determinants of successful implementation or evaluate how well implementation is working, you might go for a determinant uh, framework or an evaluation framework. But whatever your purpose, whether that's evaluating or doing something new, using an, one of these frameworks is, is really helpful, I think, and is um, a good first step. So for those of you with an interest in implementation, I'm going to touch on just a few of these briefly, and we're happy to share these slides to use as a bit of a kind of practical toolkit for you to see and what there is out there. Okay. So 
in some recent research I did looking at the implementation of mobile apps, I used this evaluation framework developed by Enola Proctor. And this taxonomy of outcomes was used to inform and guide the research questions in our research, um, but also the analysis. And this is a slightly adapted version that I put on the screen here because I added co-production and engagement into this. But essentially what you can see here is things like co-production, feasibility and acceptability lay the foundations for engagement and fidelity and then in turn sustainability and adoption. So all just really think um, useful things to be thinking about. And I think if we're all using the same language for these things, it actually makes it much easier to try and understand what we are and aren't talking about. The second model I'll just briefly mentioned is the Paris framework. So Paris stands for Promoting Action on Research, Implementation and Health Services. And this framework is slightly different because it provides a way to implement research into practice. And it has four core components that you can see here. So facilitation, innovation, recipients and contexts. And um, yeah, it just facilitation spans, spans all of those. Um, but again, happy to share these slides afterwards. And the Knowledge to Action framework. Um, which again is designed to kind of methodically guide the translation of evidence-based research findings into practice and putting knowledge into practical use. So another really uh, useful one if you're trying to implement something new. And then just finally, these models have been operationalized in some excellent ways and there's some great usable tools out there for those of you looking to implement something in practice. So this is a skills guide produced by the Education Endowment Foundation which outlines a set of practical steps implementation. It's a really fantastic resource um, online for those of you working in school-based contexts or actually I think you could use it more broadly than that too. And then finally, the hexagon tool can be used by organisations to better understand how a new or existing programme or practice fits into um, and implementing sites existing working context. So that can be um, used for something slightly different. So if something's already um, happening rather than implementing something new. Okay, and I've just added some key resources. Uh, again, we're happy to share the slides with some good, uh, good links. And I think I'm now passing on to Thanks, Holly. Uh, so great to see. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, wonderful. Oh, thank you. Good. Thumbs up at the back. Love it. Um, right, I've got to get used to all these different screens, but um, I've got the privilege of really telling you about some of our work that we've been doing, um, which has been generously supported by um, Emerging Minds. And it's really about kind of how our work fits in and, and how we're um, furthering the kind of implementation research within children and people's mental health. So we'll go on to talk about uh, a couple of systematic reviews or we'll mention them, but again, we'll provide you slides afterwards. Um, we uh, set up a specialist interest research group um, called Bridge, so we'll tell you a little bit about some of the activities and outputs there. And then most importantly, and uh, more lastly, we've been focused on our Bridging the Gap project. So we're going to share what we've been doing as part of our Emerging Minds um, uh, programme of work uh, and also some of the key insights, kind of hot off the press, I think it's fair to say, Holly, isn't it? Um, so there's more to come. Um, and then we're really hoping that um, with all of that learning and with your collective wisdom and knowledge in the room, we can then start to think about how we can further this kind of programme of work uh, going forwards for children and people's uh, mental health. It's also fair to say that as part of our um, Emerging Minds work, we've um, really enjoyed having uh, young advisors and parent care advisors along the ride with us. It's been really important to us. So um, a, a big shout out to uh, Georgia and Taishe, who I think are in the room. Um, so massive thank you there uh, to uh, wonderful kind of co-researchers that have been with us on this journey um, and again in kind of crucial research experience along the way too. Uh, we've also had some wonderful parent care advisors and young people as part of our steering committees, which has just been so invaluable and also helping us shape the way that we share knowledge. So a lot of this is about how we share knowledge um, and young people and parents and carers are really uh, guiding that process uh, for us as well. So um, Bridge, we set up Bridge as part of the Specialist Interest Research Group um, Opportunity Through Emerging Minds. It's a bit of a mouth, so I'll read it out, but essentially it sounds for uh, and I'm so impressed by the way that we got this acronym to fit. Um, <laughs> but, uh, building research implementation to develop and grow evidence based practice of children and young people's mental health. Um, and as part of that, we brought together academics, clinicians, commissioners, policymakers, HEE, young people, parents, and carers 
um, as a group that are really interested in this area. We hope that this specialist interest group and um, research group will continue. Um, so if there are people in the audience that would like to participate going forwards and be a member of this uh, group, then um, all of our details are in the uh, the directory, do you call it the directory uh, of people that are here today. Uh, so do drop us an email, send us an email and we'll be sure to add you. We did a, a few really important things as part of this specialist interest research group. One was around kind of prioritising what we needed to do. We worked with parents and carers um, to think about how we can empower parents and carers to ask the right questions around evidence and research when they're seeking support for their children and young people. Um, most importantly, we developed lots of relationships across the country of people that were interested um, and have had some great collaborations. We also uh, developed a, um, a systematic review um, uh, on barriers and facilitators to implementation in children and people's mental health. So I'm going to take you through some of the kind of headlines, um, if that's OK. Uh, and again, bear them in mind for when it comes to the kind of discussion element a bit later. So I'll try not to go uh, in uh, to too much detail with these. Um, but the question essentially was uh, from the evidence, what are the barriers and facilitators to implementation in children and young people's mental health? And these kind of were grouped broadly into kind of two categories, clinician barriers and organisational barriers. Um, so I'm going to take you through some of the kind of headlines. Um, a lot of you will uh, really, um, uh, a lot of this will resonate with you, I'm sure. Um, so um, from a clinician perspective, uh, there was a lot of uh, clinician resistance um, that we picked up on from the literature. The perception that research manuals and research isn't always uh, practical to be used in clinical settings and the manuals are rigid and don't have kind of great acceptability or usability in the real world. There's also this kind of competing priorities agenda that we've talked about a lot today already that um, unfortunately our services have such high demand and it's a real struggle to kind of fit innovation, implementation and evidence base and thinking in new creative ways. There's inadequate knowledge, um, so clinicians just aren't always aware of what the latest evidence is, what the latest research is, what the latest knowledge is um, uh, and the accessibility of information. The lack of structure, um, roles, accountability, responsibility, uh, a lack of continuous learning opportunities within uh, that kind of um, uh, clinician level. And of course, unfortunately, we have quite high, high staff turnover within uh, children and people's mental health settings, which always makes it difficult to sustain new practice and innovation. Moving on to kind of wider organisational barriers. Um, now, again, no surprises, but time and resources um, was a major barrier. So time taken to, to think about, you know, new ways of working, to embed new ways of working, particularly at this time, uh, is very difficult. Funding, again, a major barrier. Costs has been found to be one of the most important and unfortunately least changeable barriers. If we know anything from some of the models that Holly was talking about earlier, we know we need dedicated roles for implementation, for leadership, people to coordinate uh, and um, manage those kind of implementation activities. And again, that often needs funding. Uh, culture and climate within organisations. So um, being kind of ready for change and implementation readiness. There are some measures that look at implementation readiness of organisations. You know, are, are, are the directors on board, are senior leaders on board? Um, is there that kind of culture of wanting to embed new things? And that leads, of course, on to a lack of infrastructure and readiness and willingness to try different things within an organisation. And again, just generally this kind of lack of support from a leadership, knowledge, clarity, guidance and adaptability kind of process. <clears throat> then when we look at facilitators from the literature, they kind of a lip, they kind of the converse of the barriers, really. Um, but actually really thinking about how we can work with clinicians to um, ensure that they're open to innovation, ensure that they're open to change, um, have that kind of yes mentality, have that kind of um, uh, passion to try new things. We need to kind of uh, garner that. Uh, support, so leadership support, and again, the types of leadership and uh, styles is really, really important. Individual characteristics of um, clinicians are also uh, really key. Um, so thinking about kind of infusing people and um, uh, improving their level of self-efficacy, that kind of belief that they can do things different um, and uh, do things well. 
education and training was obviously, uh, again, something that we can easily put into place around what the latest research and evidence is telling us to close that gap that we were talking about earlier. Really thinking about other roles that are really uh, facilitative within CAM settings. Administrators, you know, receptionists, they often um, don't, get, don't get seen as important roles, but actually they're incredibly key in things like um, implementation of evidence and research into practice. So again, thinking about adaptations, flexibility for clinicians. Two um, implementation professors that I have the uh, honour of working with uh, I've coined the term, the term kind of knowledge in practice in context. So really thinking about what knowledge do we have from our research, from lots of research that you guys are doing in the room. How can we adapt and tweak that to the context of our services uh, to make it um, more usable uh, for clinicians? And again, organisational facilitators. So this kind of allowing people time within their job plans, um, allowing people those kind of development opportunities is really key. Funding, again, commitment of funding for some of these roles or piloting some of these roles. And that's something that we've done in our local uh, trust and local area, and it's working really well. Again, trying to um, think about the styles and type of leadership um, across the organisation and implementation readiness is also key. Um, and also thinking about how we can uh, reward our staff, um, uh, not in a monetary kind of way, but um, you know, by giving them opportunities, by allowing them to attend wonderful conferences like this. It doesn't take much to infuse and encourage uh, staff to take on a new way of working. So out of uh, this work and another review that Holly's led on, which looks at um, uh, digital apps and the implementation of digital apps, we've come up with some kind of practical tips. Uh, but again, we want to further this conversation with you uh, towards the end of the session. So ring fencing funding for implementation of evidence research and services is key. So uh, this is what, one of the things that we must do. We, mu we, we, we uh, must um, ensure that our directors and our uh, senior leaders and our commissioners are on board with that. We must prioritise the implementation process beyond the end of research trials. So all of you academics in the room, um, loads of you, we need to be thinking about how we sustain your wonderful work and how we get that into practice. Uh, training and upskilling of staff uh, to recognise the importance of integrating evidence-based practice is absolutely key. You know, what are the hot topics, the key things for staff that they're worried about at the moment and how can we help? We've got so much knowledge and so much to give from a clinical academic perspective. We need to be meeting them there in their particular work environment. And academics and researchers um, and research funders should also be encouraged to increase their adoption of implementation research designs and the use of implementation outcomes, as Holly talked about earlier, alongside effectiveness outcomes. And we are starting to see that much more in some of the kind of funded randomised control trials coming through. So we've done a lot of great work through the Emerging Minds uh, funding and support, and that's also led on to um, our latest programme of work, uh, Bridging the Gap project, um, which is uh, led by Holly and Kate. Um, and it really looks at aiming to investigate factors further, which optimise the implementation of research and evidence into practice for young people's mental health, but across all of these different disciplines, so clinical, commissioning, academic. We've used survey designs, interviews, focus groups. We've gathered uh, detailed case study examples, really to learn and to um, provide recommendations to all of us about how we can do this better. And we've produced a tool to evaluate the implementation and assess barriers in practice. And we've started to test the feasibility of this and hope to test the validity and reliability in a further pilot study. And Holly's just going to come back up and, um, uh, and uh, say a little bit about kind of key insights now from our learning. Um, so I hope to be able to present some recommendations <laughs> today. It's a six month project and if it's everything else is pushed and squeeze our timelines. And um, but we have started a qualitative analysis of the focus groups and the interviews and things. Um, but some kind of initial insights that are coming from this work really are that there's a huge amount of interest from researchers, clinicians, um, clinicians, commissioners um, with this. And people have helped us share on Twitter. And it's just been really fantastic to see how much people want to help and be involved in this. The other thing is, I think there's a huge funding gap for the implementation 
part in research and in practice. I know even from my experience of working on an RCT for a mobile app, um, took years and years, lots of money, um, and actually the implementation part at the end, um, yeah, almost, yeah, it, it's difficult to do that part when the money's ran out basically, and postdocs leave and RAs leave, and that, how do you do that part? So I think that's tricky. And then even just, particularly for digital interventions, thinking about commercial viability and how do you sustain the technology and all of that. So I really think embedding implementation from the outset um, is so important. And I had a really interesting conversation with Dan Hayes, who does a lot of work on social prescribing, and actually they've set up a trial that they've embedded implementation from the outset. So I think that's a really fantastic model. And we're hopefully going to include his study as one of the kind of case studies in this work. The other thing that's come out a lot from clinicians and commissioners is, is that it seems to be easier to implement something brand new and kind of uh, you've got an intervention that seems to be working quite well and embed that in something that's already happening. But changing or de-implementing or decommissioning existing structures and the way things uh, are currently being delivered is really tricky. How do you make people do something differently that they've been doing the same for years and years? So I think that's uh, complicated. Um, some commissioners were telling me, particularly in London, that they're covering several boroughs, with potentially different political parties, and how do you get any kind of consistency if things look so different and populations look so different, um, even within one kind of geo geographical area. So our plan currently is to develop top 10 tips or something along those lines for decision makers, so commissioners and funders for um, increasing accessibility and uptake of evidence. I think Georgia and Taishi are hopefully going to be working on a kind of one page document, what is commissioning? I mean, even I had to get to grips with that when I first started working on this project it means something slightly different in different contexts. So uh, working on that for young, for young people. Um, so I think that will be really useful. And we're going to be working with different graphic illustrators and people that are better at design than us to, to do those. And then some key recommendations with kind of case studies and um, I guess examples of good practice linked to those. So some academic outputs too. So it's all very exciting. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we don't have much time left, but we're working on it. Um, oh, good. So I, I mean, if it's helpful to give a few examples of um, how we've used implementation science to embed uh, new practices in young people's mental health. I, Hopefully that will be useful um, and help shape the discussion that we're going to have in a moment. Um, but I, I, I don't know about anyone else in the room, but embedding routine outcome measures in clinical practice is incredibly hard. Does anyone, has anyone had that experience or have you all cracked it and you need to share something with us? I don't know, but um, we find it really hard to embed routine outcome measures. You know, um, that they're, they're so clinically useful, but they're still just not routinely used. So what we've done, and this is a model that um, I'll, I'll tell you about in a moment as well, but we've gone to the literature. Holly uh, uh, has done particular research around implementing outcomes in practice and looking at the kind of implementation facilitators and barriers. And uh, believe it or not, there's quite a lot of research out there um, looking at this kind of arena. So we've kind of brought these things together. We've looked at what the facilitators are. We've looked at what the kind of barriers are specifically to implementing routine outcome measurement. And then we've just started to develop, you know, infographics, things that look a little bit more um, attractive to clinicians so that we can start sharing some of our learning with them and, and try and move that then into action. So we've used implementation science models. We've used research and evidence, um, some of which Holly's done, to look at how we can improve the uptake of uh, the clinical uptake of outcome monitoring. Um, and there's another uh, famous implementation model by Fixin and, and Blase. Um, and again, I've just used this and the kind of, you know, factors that they kind of recommend that you look at that make successful implementation. And then we tried to do that within our service setting. So we looked at management support and resource allocation. So we have a research assistant psychologist or an assistant psychologist now that specifically is working on this implementation program of work to get outcome measures embedded into practice. We've been training and skilling up uh, admin. We've um, been offering supervision and training, uh, you know, all of these kind of things within the uh, within the different boxes. We've tried to map against like a change mechanism um, and we've just started that work and we've already seen a slight uptick in the use of outcome measures. So things like we've developed an e-learning module for outcome measurement. And this is all informed by what we know that works in implementation. 
So that's kind of one key example. We've got time just for another couple of examples. Um, so um, within our Young People's Mental Health setting in um, the east of England and in Norfolk and Waveney, we've, we really drive home the importance of literature and evidence and research. So all of this wonderful work, again, that many of you are doing in the room, we do not want it to go to waste. You know, you work so hard in developing new interventions, researching new interventions, um, that we have a model um, in the east of England. Uh, so in my NHS England role, we have a model where we'll, we'll think about what are the main issues that we're all facing across CAM services, even people's mental health services. We then do scoping reviews, rapid literature reviews. We try and pick up on all of this information that you as academics, many of you in the room are, are, are providing to us. And then we'll do accessible webinars and workshops called learning from the literature sessions. I don't know if Maria's in the room, but she's doing one soon on single session interventions for children and people's mental health. And then we try and pull out the implementation factors, you know, so if you were, if you were going to do this within your service, how do you need to train clinicians? How do you, what kind of role do you, roles do you need to have to make this a success? We've done similarly with um, brief crisis interventions for children and young people. We know it's a big policy driver. Uh, we've um, done a literature review, we've worked with a particular service to offer them implementation support. So again, that's where you need that kind of dedicated support. And we've also been thinking about other models um, that we can bring in to um, inform active implementation of evidence and research, the, the great stuff that people are doing. 